Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of Sports Talk. I'm Gordy Deal and our guest today is somebody you're probably familiar with if you followed Rutgers athletics, high school athletics, or local radio anytime in the past say 15 or 20 years. Uh, he's a friend of mine, Bruce Johnson. Welcome to the program. Good to be here. Make me feel old. <laughs> um, there are a lot of things that you have done in terms of local broadcasting since 1980, your early days at WCTC Radio in New Brunswick. Um, starting, I guess, with high school athletics. I mean, that was something that uh, kind of kicked off your broadcast career in a way. Talk about that. Well, I came here in 80, as you mentioned, which was at the uh, very end of the Kenny Jackson era, which would have been the one of the last great local high school eras, Kenny Jackson from South River. So I was on the back end of that um, and, uh, you know, did play-by-play -play early on back in the early 80s of uh, uh, what at that time was Middlesex County um, type athletics. Now it's Greater Middlesex Conference Athletics and, uh, you know, a lot of good memories. It was a lot of fun doing high school football, going to build Denny Stadium at South River and Memorial Stadium in New Brunswick and Brooksfield and Somerville. It's, you know, it's, I mean, I think for all of us in the business who do play-by-play, -play, you know, you're, you look back fondly on your high school days as kind of when you cut your teeth. And then uh, a graduation, if you will, of sorts to uh, taking over the Rutgers job. For somebody now who went to South River High School um, and kind of was familiar with uh, serious football tradition, you went to Ohio University and then came back to your old roots. Now, was there an allegiance to Ohio at the time? And say, when you started doing the Rutgers play-by-play -play stuff, did you feel, uh, did you need to learn or get to like Rutgers at that point? Or? You know, I'm from the area, as you infer, and I was never a big Rutgers fan. I guess I kind of fall into that um, large population of people that kind of have Rutgers in the back of their minds if you live here but don't really look at it wholeheartedly. And I was a big Ohio State man when I was in, in Ohio. I went to Ohio U, but covered Ohio State. And of course, in Ohio, the Buckeyes are a religion. So uh, it took a little bit getting used to coming back from Big Ten country and, and covering Rutgers because it was a different thing. It was a real transition period. It was post Princeton, post Bucknell, post Lehigh, and you know, playing Penn State and Alabama and, and Tennessee and before they got into the Big East. So it took a little bit getting used to because it was kind of um, uh, a very hazy area. I think even to, to today, people look at Rutgers Athletics and go, what is it? What are they trying to do? When will they win? Why do they lose so often? And uh, it was even more so back, back in those days. So it took a while to get used to going from what you would call bigger time college to what is now Rutgers. But, but RU is slowly but surely getting there, particularly in basketball. Your, um, your first football season was 1986. The first basketball season was actually the fall before that, 85-86. You did not start off on a good note with Rutgers basketball in terms of your play-by-play -play career and not your on-air ability, obviously, but the, uh, the feeling of the season because those three years of Craig Littlepage, who was the coach at the time, were terrible. Does that actually impact you emotionally? Do you get involved? where you actually find yourself cheering, not so much on air, but inside? Does it make your job easier when your team wins? Yeah, it, it definitely makes it easier if they win and win big. But I think, and you know it from being in the business, that you would prefer to do a good broadcast of a bad loss than a bad broadcast of a good win. So you're always first and foremost worrying about yourself and how well am I doing? Am I uh, carrying the broadcast? Do I know what, what's going on with the game? Am I on top of it? But to get back to your question, uh, it's tough. I mean, you mentioned Craig Littlepage, who was the head coach at Rutgers for three years, and you know a lot of people like to call that the Craig Littlepage error instead of era. Uh, he was like 23 and 63, had 16 game losing streaks, 17 game losing streaks, bad losses upon bad losses, and clearly a program which hit rock bottom. And I think after a while, uh, truth be known, I think that people kind of you know, it's a guilt by association. People kind of look at you as being a, a quote unquote loser. Well, you know, he's the play by play man for mm -hmm. that losing team. And, you know, maybe they can't do any better than him because they're losing. And <laughs> so uh, you get a little bit of that kind of, which is probably more paranoia than it is reality. But uh, you, you just have fun doing it though. Um, and then Bob Wenzel came along, of course, and um, had that Cinderella year in 88, 89. Rutgers came out of nowhere and went, won the Atlantic 10 tournament, went to the NCAA tournament, 
and it was Nirvana at that point in time. So not to be cliche-ish, but I think you also appreciate the good times much more because you've been to the, uh, to the nadir, to the depths of, uh, of depression. Now you've seen the depths and you have not seen the really great stuff. Um, and having been associated with Rutgers for some time now, one, are you optimistic? I guess that you can see the great stuff, and two, are you realistic that you will see great stuff? You know, there's an old saying that uh, Rutgers fans have more patience than Robert Wood Johnson <laughs> University Hospital. Um, you know, uh, I am, I'm not an eternal optimist, although I do believe that with the advent of new athletic director Bob Mulcahy, um, with Vivian Stringer doing a great job with women's basketball, with Kevin Bannon, uh, doing a good job so far with men's basketball, and the jury is still out on, on Terry Shea as football coach. I do believe that at some point uh, all three programs will be winning um, on a pretty consistent basis. Now when I say winning, I'm not talking about Nebraska winning in football, I'm not talking about um, uh, Duke winning in basketball. I'm talking about, you know, every third year going to an NCAA tournament, every fifth year going to a football ball game. Um, I think it will happen um, within a decade, within 15 years, which to some people is an eternity, but really not that far away in the overall scope of, of college athletics. Uh, but I think that uh, a lot of it is Bob Mulcahy. And uh, I've often said when you talk about me as a play-by-play -play man, my two wishes, and I could die happy as a play-by-play -play man, is to go to a football ball game, uh, win or lose. It could be Shreveport, it could be the Pool and Weed Eater Independence Bowl down in Shreveport, <laughs> Louisiana. It doesn't have to be the Rose Bowl. Uh, I just want to go to a ball game and do play-by-play -play of a ball game and then, of course, win an NCAA men's basketball game. So I'm not asking for a lot, I don't think, but uh, hopefully it'll be within my lifetime. Um, you get mail about this stuff. People come up to you during broadcasts and want to chew your ear off about it. Um, what is your philosophy on why Rutgers has kind of been in this state of mediocrity for such a long time and not much more than that? Well, not, not to sound too uh, company line-ish, you know, too pro-Rutgers, but if you really look at the timeline and look at what we're talking about here, you know, Rutgers has only been giving out scholarships in football for under 25 years now. You have to go back to like the mid to late 70s under Frank Burns when they tried to go to a near full-fledged scholarship mm -hmm. program. So we're talking about, you know, less than 25 years. Uh, I mean, you look at Oklahoma football, Nebraska football, Syracuse football, um, and these programs have been winning for, for a half century, if not more. And you just don't come into a football situation and go, we want to win now we're giving out scholarships now, thus we will win now. It's not that easy. It's, you know, um, football is an arduous task in terms of trying to build it up, much like a military endeavor. It's very, very hard. And so I think that football really has not had um, the proper shot it needs. They've had their shining moments, but, but surely not enough and not enough wins. And I think that uh, football needs about 10 or 15 more years. Uh, with the present situation of Bob Mulcahy as AD or, or wherever he hand, hand picks to follow him with uh, Terry Shea or whomever is head coach. I think that football, if they continue as they are, they'll win. But it's not been a long time. Uh, and I mentioned something before about winning. Uh, you know, people talk about Rutgers having tradition. Rutgers really has history, not tradition. People always fall back on the 1869 first collegiate football game beating Princeton 6-4. to four. It's history, not tradition. They have not been able to build on that for a long, long time. The bottom line is they have got to win and keep on winning. You look back at it. I've done play-by-play -play now. If you combine the football and men's basketball seasons, I've done about 28 seasons. And about eight of them have been winning seasons. Eight out of 28. So you're not going to be able to build any kind of tradition and develop any kind of a winning strategy if you don't win, as, as obvious as that sounds. Uh, but it's the old chicken versus the egg. Do you start to win when you build tradition or do you build tradition by winning? And so I think Rutgers right now, although a lot of people don't want to hear it, uh, Rutgers right now just needs more time. Um, as, as much as you've watched over the years, and you mentioned eight winning season, eight winning seasons out of a 28 broadcasted. That ever make you just want to take off the headphones, slam them down, and walk away? Sure. I mean, has it impacted you emotionally that much? 
Football did uh, a couple of years ago, 0 and 11. You know what happened with football? And God love Terry Shea, the Rutgers head football coach. I have never met anyone so undaunted in his task. I mean, if I was a football player or if I was one of his troops, I mean, I would, I would follow that man, you know, right to the wall because this guy has no uh, negative thoughts, is unwavering. I'm, to go 0 and 11, in this area with the media exposure and the media pressure and and just to go winless in a given year i mean that takes a lot of intestinal fortitude to persevere week in and week out day in and day out hour in hour out so uh you know you know i, I admire him greatly uh but it got to me it got to me i mean it's well documented that you go back in many a game it was 28 nothing with eight minutes left in the first quarter and we're talking about doing a three and a half hour broadcast not counting pregame, not counting postgame. It's a long football game. And uh, what do you say when it's 28 to nothing with uh, you know, eight minutes left in the opening period? You don't say a whole lot, uh, particularly if you're hired by Rutgers to do the play-by-play. -play. You can't start doing a, you know, a Mike and the Mad Dog routine on them and, and, and mm -hmm. go off and, and, and get the yucks because, uh, believe me, I've done that on occasion and I've got my hand slapped for doing that by, by my employers at Rutgers, rightfully so. So um, what happens is, you know, the bottom line, Gordy, is that there is no anticipation during the week. You have no enjoyment leading up to the game. It's almost like, you know, going to work um, and, and working at a, at a job. You know, doing play-by-play -play shouldn't be that way. It should be a lot of fun. You're doing play-by-play -play of a game. It's what people like you and I have dreamed about doing. And it should be fun. And um, part of the fun is particularly in football leading up to the game. Wow, it's, you know, the game is coming up, the marching band's coming out, uh, the, the color and pageantry. Mm -hmm. And it, as corny as it sounds, a lot of that is what turns us on about college football. And when you don't look forward to it, it makes your job more drudgery. And so I think that year, uh, for me professionally, was tough because it wasn't fun. Um, for those not totally familiar with what the job entails, um, first of all, you are news and sports director, WCTC Radio, employed by Rutgers to do the play by play. Um, so explain how in the late fall, when football starts to overlap basketball, what a week can be like for you, including your radio station duties that have nothing to do with Rutgers on-air broadcast. Yeah, I, I can relate. The, the worst case scenario would be the election uh, situation where, uh, just to give you, an, um, and you know this, but to give the audience a kind of a look at what happens. As you mentioned, the football and basketball season begin to overlap and now throw in my, my duties as WCTC news director with uh, an election night coming up where we have eight to ten people going out and uh, just that alone, just preparing for election night is, is very difficult and, and, and time consuming. So uh, leading up to that week, for instance, coming up this year, we have Big East Men's Basketball Media Day which is an all-day venture in New York on the Wednesday preceding election night. We have Big East Women's Basketball Day on the Thursday preceding election night. Again, takes up most of the day. Then we have a game that Saturday, Rutgers taking on Temple. Uh, thankfully, it's a home game, no travel. Well, it's, it's not a home game. It's down in Philadelphia, but you don't lose a day of travel. So right away, you've got uh, two media days taking up two critical days before election night. Mm -hmm. You've got a game on Saturday, and it takes a good... 25 to 30 hours, manpower hours, to get ready for a football broadcast. And then, as you said, then you've got college basketball right around the corner in terms of getting ready to do both men's and women's play-by-play. -play. So uh, we spend, you know, from 6.15 a.m. until about 8 o'clock at night on a daily basis in late October and early November with that crush of football, men's basketball, women's basketball, and election coverage. So it gets to be quite hectic, but it's a lot of fun. I was going to, you mentioned a little bit of being a fun, but do you find that uh, the sports play-by-play -play can be a release for maybe the grind of a, of a news day? I mean, do you look forward to one more than the other? Oh, yeah. It, it's an escape. You know, once you get into the booth and put the headphones on, you know that nobody can page you, call your cell phone, you know, tap on your shoulder, hey, Bruce, you know, I can't do this, I can't find that. And pretty much, you know that you're off limits, and so you can you can really, particularly if it's a good game, you can kind of immerse yourself in it, and kind of get away from that that daily pressure. But you know, as soon as you head back to the radio station afterwards, it all comes back at you. So uh, it's never ending at times, particularly then. Um, 
What about the professional level? whether it be NBA broadcasts or NFL. Let's balance those for right now. Um, a lot different from what you're doing now, I would imagine. Um, but have you ever thought about going to that level? Is that something that you would pursue? I thought about it. Um, you know, no one is knocking on my door looking for me to do that. Um, I like what I'm doing. I really enjoy it. Um, I'm from Spotswood, went to South River High, as you mentioned. Uh, live now in East Brunswick, have a wife, uh, Patty, and, and two teenage boys in the East Brunswick school system. I live 20 minutes away from work. Uh, Rutgers is virtually in our backyard geographically, so it's not like traveling you know, to, uh, to St. John's to do a game mm -hmm. from Central Jersey. And uh, you know, it's a very comf comfortable situation in terms of you know, being the hometown guy. And, um, and I'm very happy doing that. Uh, when you go to the pro level, when you talk about doing NBA basketball, you're talking about an 81 game schedule where you have 40, 41 road games. And we're talking about Seattle and mm -hmm. you know, Golden State and Dallas and San Antonio. A lot of travel, a lot of, a lot of time away from home. And I think when you get to my age and when you have teenage boys, um, I would prefer to, to be with them. And you know, I read John Madden's book, John Madden, the of course great NFL coach and uh, color commentator and uh, he said he really knew he had lost contact with his family when he came home after a road trip and uh, he said to his wife where's Johnny and she said uh, Johnny uh, drove down to to campus and he didn't even know that his son a was driving mm -hmm. and B was in college now a lot of that probably is exaggeration right. but, but the points well taken that uh, I've opted to take the course of being a homebody and, and, and staying close to the ranch and, and not traveling over God's creation like a Marv Albert or a Bob Costas. It means a lot to me. So it's not as glamorous as it uh, sometimes appears to. No, it's not. I mean, you know, every hotel room looks the same. Um, every, uh, you know, Denny's, which is a free plug, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, they all, everything looks the same. Every airplane looks the same. It's, I've, al I've always said, unless you're going to Hawaii, which I've been to, or uh, Florida, um, or you know, maybe overseas. Unless you're going on an exotic road trip, I'd prefer every game to be a, a home game. I have no great designs <laughs> on going to St. Bonaventure, which is the end of the earth, or going to Morgantown, West Virginia, or going to um, State College, Pennsylvania, or St. Louis, Missouri. I mean, it's, it's just, a, it's just a, an airplane and a, and a cab ride or a rental car, and that's about all it is. So there's no glamour in that travel. State college for the atmosphere, unbelievable, isn't, isn't worth going to. Yeah, it to is. To experience, if you could, if you could be like Elizabeth Montgomery on Bewitched and just twinkle your nose and go there, <laughs> and then come back, it's an ungodly four-hour drive on one-lane highways. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if you, if you ever, if anybody here has not, if anybody watching has not been to Penn State for a football Saturday, I mean that is, you know. You've died and gone to heaven. I mean, that is that is where you should go. No knock on Rutgers, but it's not happening here yet. But to go to State College, Beaver Stadium, 98,000 people, the the uh, uh, idyllic setting of the Nittany Mountains in the background, uh, the blue and white, the whole thing. Every, every store downtown, mm -hmm. uh, blue and white, and committed to Penn State. You know, it's it's really uh, it's quite a quite a rush. So based on that, tell me about um, the most maybe the most memorable. Rutgers broadcast experience? Not necessarily your favorite season, but maybe a single out, maybe a broadcast, and then we'll talk about best football and basketball memories. Well, the best broadcast w would have to be also the most exciting game in terms of memory, and that would be the Bob Wenzel year when, again, that Cinderella team literally came out of nowhere and uh, had the Atlantic 10 tournament championship game at home. It was on ESPN TV, it was Penn State, it was a packed house. Oh, yeah. Great game, winner goes to the NCAA tournament, and Rutgers won it. You know, all the people in the stands had what they called their bobsicles, which, mm -hmm. you know, were their wooden sticks with Bob Wenzel's cut out head on it. Um, and after the game, the great, the great recollection is after the game, a couple of the players, you know, climbing up on top of the backboards yeah. and sitting up there and kind of looking down upon their domain. And here is what we have accomplished. These are our subjects, these people love us. and. It was quite a love fest, and, uh, and to me, that in, in my time here, it's been the most dramatic and most memorable occasion. Um, and that was 1989. 89, March of 89. So coming up on uh, 10, 11 years ago, um, you foresee things under Kevin Bannon, 
possibly returning to that way? Oh, sure. I mean, only a couple of years ago, you had the Jeff Billet buzzer beating shot against Georgetown in the Big East tournament quarterfinals at Madison Square Garden. I think a lot of the new RU fans would probably call that their greatest memory of the 90s. And, I mean, you, you can't overlook what Vivian Stringer has done. We're heading into a women's basketball season, you know, which can easily be a Final Four team, uh, can easily be a national championship team. And uh, probably my favorite women's moment would be when they beat Connecticut mm -hmm. a couple of years ago to break Connecticut's 53-game Big East winning streak. But uh, what Vivian has done, and there's a lot of excitement with women's basketball and with, with Rutgers, and I think that probably the next great memory will be forthcoming from that team probably this year and quite possibly hoisting a national crown down in Philadelphia. Mm. Um, which is obviously the big difference between football and basketball. That With basketball, if you grab one, maybe two guys, you can totally revamp a program recruiting-wise. Whereas a football, one or two won't necessarily do it. Um, but you've mentioned a little bit about the fans. Um, you live among them. Your neighbors, some of them, are Rutgers fans. You broadcast to them every day. What is it about the Rutgers fan? Can you explain what the Rutgers fan is or wants? Well, to begin with, there's clearly not enough of them. That would help to have more. The Rutgers fan, you know, is, um, is a long-suffering, um, kind of... Um, um, never happy type fan, meaning that they've been burned so many mm -hmm. times that even with the good times, they're kind of skeptical. They kind of go, is it really that good? I mean, will I wake up tomorrow and will it all be gone? Or, yes, I want to enjoy this win, but next week's a tougher game. And I think that uh, Rutgers fans, much like their play-by-play -play guy, have not had a lot of chance, a lot of times to kind of release and go, oh man, this is great stuff. Right. And so I think that, uh, like anything else, you, you tend to get a little bit um, cynical and, uh, I mean, if you're a Rutgers fan, nobody can knock Rutgers, but you can. And, <laughs> and, and Rutgers fans are often the hardest people on Rutgers. And I think a lot of it stems from not winning enough. And um, a lot of it stems from watching Princeton, their longtime arch rival, you know, becoming media darlings during NCAA tournaments. And, and so I think there's a lot of uh, lack of self-esteem in terms of, you know, where they, they fit on the overall fandom geographical map. They're jealous of their counterparts in State College mm -hmm. and they're jealous of their counterparts at St. John's. And so I think there are long-suffering fans who, Lord knows, they need a, a big-time win, more than one big-time win, real soon. Uh, basketball has seen the fans come back. Um, although the Lewis Brown Athletic Center is a lot easier to fill than Rutgers Stadium, will the football fans come? And are they going to come see a 5-6 and six team that is showing improvement? Will they be supportive along the way? Or are you going to have to break out and have a seven and four, eight and three type season for them to start filling the stadium? In reality, in reality, in our area, people have talked about it a lot. You've got New York, you've got Philadelphia, you've got a lot of alternatives to spend your your um, disposable entertainment dollar. Uh, people will not come out to Rutgers Stadium to watch a football team who's going to lose or who does not win more than its fair share. And so it's going to be as long as they do not win often enough, the fans will not come out. Um, there's a hardcore 25 to 30,000 people who will come out. But uh, in order to fill a 41,500-seat stadium to get that last 11,000, it's going to be uh, winning and winning often. And so um, I would be less than candid if I didn't say to you that um, if they went 8-3 and three next year and then turned around and went 2-9, and nine, Whatever fan base they built up that one year, they would lose. I mean, that's the way it is around here. It's kind of what have you done for us lately. Right. Uh, based on that, we talked a little bit about basketball. Best football memory highlight? Best football memory would be um, one. One would be at Penn State, beating Penn State back in the late 80s. Not a great Penn State team. Tony Saka was quarterback, mm -hmm. but it was a great win. To, to win at Penn State, 21-16. to 16. And I'll never forget, the game ends on a fourth down incompletion, game ends, and 97,000 people didn't believe it and wanted more. That Nobody left. They were waiting like for the fifth quarter hmm. to, to occur. And it was kind of neat to be an RU person and, and watch 97,000 blue and white faithful just act in, in complete uh, denial in stunned fashion. 1B would be winning at Michigan State right. the same year. And uh, that was the year after Michigan State had won the Rose Bowl. A lot of that Rose Bowl team had come back. 
and for Rutgers to go into Big Ten country and beat the defending Big Ten champion was, was a gigantic win. And, uh, but again, we're talking about late 90s. So right. we're not talking, or late 80s, I should say. So we're not talking about many great football memories uh, recently. Um, just a couple minutes to go, but tell me um, in broadcasting, whether it be play by play or news, who, who's been your role model? Well, in play by play, certainly Marv Albert, um, any, anyone who's grown up, uh, particularly in my age bracket, mid 40s. I mean, we're people who, when we were younger, we heard Marv in the glory days mm -hmm. of the late 60s and early 70s do Nick basketball. And so, you know, certainly Marv Albert uh, would be that. And, uh, and people like Bob Costas. Uh, have been an influence because these are people who uh, I marvel at. I mean, these are people I bow to and I, I go, you know, you're, I'm not worthy because these are people who have the incredible ability, A, to be consistent to, to the point of near perfection and to be able to nail, what we say, nail every broadcast, nail every storyline. These people just don't make mistakes when it comes to capturing the essence of a game, why is it important, what the drama is. So. I would think uh, Marv Albert and Bob Costas would be two, two of my uh, heroes, if you will. Can you, um, can you imagine yourself in your maybe Rutgers football ball scenario or in the NCAA basketball tournament making the call that would go down, say, in radio history with Bruce Johnson behind the mic and Rutgers about to really do something big? Have you dreamed that in your head and could you, could you do one now, possibly what I'm going to be like? You want me to do play-by-play -play now? Just of, right now. of what you thought you're... The big moment would be like. Well, how about a game-winning field goal by uh, Steve Barone, the current kicker? I would go um, um, Barone in the game now to attempt a 51-yard field goal. Uh, it would give Rutgers a one-point lead. Uh, the center, Sean O'Hara, with the snap, the snap back, the hole down, the kick is up, and the kick is long enough, and it is good. Rutgers wins the national championship. Yeah, that would be memorable. That would be. Thanks for coming in today. Thanks, Gordy. Good All to right. be here. Best of luck to Rutgers, too. And thanks for Bruce Johnson for coming in, my boss, for uh, seven years over at WCTC Radio. It's good to have him in today. Hope you enjoyed the Rutgers play-by-play -play memories. I'm Gordy Deal. That's Sports Talk. See you next time.